Okay, I'm glad you're back to learn more on the path to mastering Simulink. Last time, we looked at how to create a Simulink model and run a simulation. I really want to get to some more advanced material, but before we do that, I think it will be really helpful for you to familiarize yourself with some of the common blocks available in Simulink. I'm going to help you do that by looking at some of the key blocks that I use on a regular basis that I think you will likely use as well. So this lesson will really be about common blocks that you would use for almost any kind of Simulink model. These are the blocks that are used for simulations of physical systems, testing mathematical models, embedded classical and supervisory controls, data processing, and so on. So with that, let's get started. The first block that I want to introduce to you is the constant block. You can populate this block with a value directly, like we did in the last lesson, or you can define a parameter name in your MATLAB base workspace via the command window, or in an M file and just use the parameter name in the constant block. We'll try it all three ways. So first off, I'm going to go ahead and create a new model. Then, with the library browser open, I'll drop in a constant block from the commonly used block section of the library browser. And then from the sync section, just like we used in the last lesson, I'll grab a numeric display block. Let's go ahead and connect the constant block to the numeric display. Now let's populate the constant value with the number 5. Then we'll run the simulation and we'll observe the numeric display's output. And indeed, the numeric display shows us that the signal coming from the constant block is the number 5. Let's try this a second way by doing this in the command window. So we'll define a parameter, and I'll call it my constant equals 7. Hit enter, and then we'll enter the parameter name my constant in the constant block's value field. When we run the simulation, we'll see that the constant block's output is 7. What if we had many constants with values assigned by parameters, and we wanted to change the values from one simulation to the next? In that case, entering the values directly in the constant blocks or entering parameters in the command window would become tedious. Fortunately, there's a better way to do this for larger models. To help ourselves out, we'll create a new M file which I'll call myparameters.m. So to create a new M file, just go to MATLAB's New menu and select Script. In this M file, we'll enter my constant equals 8, add a semicolon to prevent outputting this line to our command window, which can be annoying unless you really want these values in the command window. We'll save the M file and we'll run it by using the run button in MATLAB this time for the M file script rather than in Simulink as we did in the last lesson. Now, if we check this parameter's value in the base workspace, the value has been updated to 8. I'll run the simulation again and the numeric window shows that we successfully picked up the value from the base workspace. When we double click on the constant block, the resulting user interface that appears is called a mask. There are many standard fields available in Simulink masks, and we'll discuss what some of those do in an upcoming lesson. For now, though, we'll concentrate on just manipulating the value in the mask, either via parameter or directly. There are a couple of other things that I would like to note at this point. First off, it is possible to design your own subsystems with your own masks. In certain cases, this can be really helpful. Second, you can change the name on a constant block, or you can hide it entirely. In general, I would suggest that you set up your parameters in an M file, like we did with our third method, populate your constant block masks with them, and hide the name of your constant block. You can hide the constant block's name by right-clicking on the block, going to Format, and deselecting Show Block Name. You can then extend your constant block so that the entire parameter name shows up on the block. In some cases, though, this principle may not apply. For example, I like to rename my subsystems, but hide the names of my constant blocks in order to improve readability. Ultimately, how you handle these things is up to you, and may vary based on the block in question, as well as based on what you are modeling. There is a difference between, for example, a quick simulation exercise and working with commercial production intent embedded code. In your Simulink Library Browser's Math Operations section, you'll also see options for mathematical operations like division with the divide block, subtraction, which can be accomplished by modifying the add block, and
and multiplication with the product block. This is mostly fairly self-explanatory, but I would like to note that you'll want to watch out to make sure that you aren't ever trying to divide by zero. This is an easy mistake to make in a model if you aren't watching out for it, and it can cause errors or unexpected results. There are also blocks for performing logical and Boolean operations in the logic and bit operations section, such as the AND and OR logic gates, which can be achieved with the logical operator block. We also have blocks for inputs and outputs, which are called sources and sinks, respectively. We'll look at those more in an upcoming lesson. You'll notice in the discrete section that there are discrete blocks such as unit delays, which we can use for things like creating our own memory, delaying an action, or implementing custom discrete integrator logic, for example. The ports and subsystems section is helpful for breaking a model up into more manageable systems and can also help for creating things like enabled or triggered subsystems, which is where logic is only run under some circumstances that you define, similar to an interrupt on a microcontroller, for example. We'll come back to those in more detail later, so don't worry about it for now. User-defined functions allow us to do things like write MATLAB code, if you have some past familiarity with MATLAB, drop it into function blocks, and manipulate inputs and outputs based on the custom code. Back under commonly used blocks, MUX and DMUX blocks allow us to place signals into arrays and pull them back out of arrays. This can be helpful when we want to perform vector operations instead of scalar operations, for example. Lookup tables, commonly also known as maps, are really important. They allow us to do things that take a signal and interpolate between two points to identify an output. You could, for example, use a lookup table slash map to convert between degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius, or to map out the position command to area output on a butterfly valve. There are many, many applications for maps, and they're not just limited to two dimensions. You can go up to three dimensions with them. They're often very good on memory as well, and widely used in embedded systems. Each of these blocks includes a help button also. This is really useful for understanding what a block does and how to properly use it and configure it. After this video, I would encourage you to take the time to take some of the blocks that I've mentioned and whatever other blocks you see in the Simulink library browser that look relevant to the kind of work that you do and learn a little bit about those blocks. Drop the blocks that interest you into a model I'll read the help section for the blocks, and maybe even try some simple simulations by connecting the blocks to constant inputs and numeric display outputs like we did in the last lesson, and seeing how the blocks behave when you run the simulation. MathWorks offers a wide array of additional toolboxes that you can install and that will then appear in your Simulink library browser. Considering the huge array of Simulink library blocks available, there's no way that I can cover them all and the blocks that one person uses may vary from what another person uses. Maybe one person is really doing a lot with user-defined functions, another with Boolean logic, and a third with control systems. Whatever the case, I would encourage you to take the time to learn more about the specific blocks that are applicable to the subjects that interest you. Two specific categories of blocks that show up all the time are sources, which are inputs, and sinks, which are outputs. We'll take some time to investigate those in detail in the next lesson. For now, I hope you've enjoyed learning more about Simulink blocks and look forward to showing you sources and sinks that you can connect to your model next time.